I'm sure most of us at some point in our life have experienced rejection, whether that be from a partner, your parents, a sibling, a job offer, or what have you. We're often told not to take it personally, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt or that we don't take it to heart for a second, but you shake it off and you try to look ahead for the next opportunity. And that's the important part, that you move forward and that you let the past be in the past. Unfortunately, there are those who see rejection as a reason to enact revenge or to take what they believe is rightfully theirs, and sometimes that can lead to violence. Many believe this is what horrific fate befell a woman named Deborah Ann Wolfe, a 28-year-old nurse whose adult life had just begun when it was tragically ended in 1985. But while those closest to Deborah believe she was a victim of foul play, the authorities have denied this theory for decades, claiming the whole thing was an accident. But by the end of this video, no matter who you choose to believe, Deborah's case still goes unsolved to this day. Today on Dark Matters, the death of Debbie Wolf. Deborah Wolf, or Debbie to friends, seemed to be reaching the point in her life where everything was going right. She had a job as a nurse at a local veterans hospital, she had her own cabin in the woods where she lived with her two spoiled dogs, and she was in the beginning stages of a serious relationship with her boyfriend. She was well liked at work, never missed a shift, and did her job well. But nothing showed her true character and sense of humor better than her relationship with her mother, Jenny Edwards. Just to give you an idea of how close they were, for her mother's 50th birthday, Debbie hired a male stripper for her party as a joke. So it should have been no surprise to Jenny when Debbie gave her a male and female set of novelty dolls with parts and all for Christmas in 1985. And when Jenny shot her daughter a look, Debbie played innocent, claiming it couldn't have been her before rushing off for her holiday shift at the hospital, taking her mother's gift which was a giant stuffed unicorn, with her. Unfortunately, the happy moment will live in Jenny's memory as the last moment she would ever see her daughter alive. So the day of Debbie's disappearance, she goes to work, wishes all of her coworkers a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holidays, and then she leaves at the end of her shift in the afternoon and heads home to her cabin, which is nestled about 100 yards away from the main road near a pond and is about four miles outside of Fayetteville. It's fairly remote and a quiet area, which is good for Debbie and her two dogs, but not so good for the isolation that it forces upon her. Now, no one hears from her that night, and the next morning on December 26th, 8 a.m. rolls around, and she still hasn't showed up for her shift at the hospital. And something about this is immediately strange, as Debbie is always on time and has never missed work. Her coworkers try calling her several times, but get no answer on her home phone, so they phone Jenny to see if she knows where her daughter is. But Jenny is just as troubled as Debbie's coworkers, as she too has not heard from her daughter since the day before. She tries calling and also gets no answer. Hoping her daughter is sick and just forgot to call in, but still fearing something is off, Jenny calls a family friend named Kevin Gordon, and the two drive over to Debbie's house. Upon arriving, Jenny notices beer cans lying in the yard and Debbie's dogs running around outside, completely unsupervised, and immediately she knows something isn't right. Debbie keeps the yard pristine and always has a watchful eye on her dogs, but the feeling of unease only grows as she enters the cabin and sees several of her daughter's personal items out of place littering the floor, and she realizes the dogs haven't been fed either. After searching the house, there's still no sign of her daughter, but she does find Debbie's purse stuffed into a corner of her waterbed as if someone were trying to hide it there. Again, strange. Jenny, trying to find an explanation for her missing daughter, thinks that there may have been an emergency of some sort and decides to check her daughter's answering machine to see if it offers any answers. But there's only one message, and when she presses play, she hears an unfamiliar male voice. Hey Deb, miss you here at work today. Uh, I just wondering how you're doing. Uh, if you're able to give me a call up here at the ward, I'm at date 227007, or I'll give me a call at home tonight. Uh, You've been out a lot of days. You made me worry when you miss another one. I just want to make sure you're okay. Bye. Jenny finds the message disturbing because she doesn't recognize the man's voice and because what he's saying doesn't add up. He says Debbie's missed work for a few days, but at most she's only missed a few hours beginning that morning when she didn't arrive at eight. Growing more worried by the minute, Jenny and Kevin search the yard and skirt the bank of the pond all the way around, but there isn't a trace of Debbie. 
Jenny then does what any worried mother would do. She calls the police. And the responding officer is Captain Jack Watts, who brings a bloodhound with him to help search. Jenny tells Watts that she and Kevin have searched the grounds, the house, and around the pond. And for some reason, Watts assumes that they had the means to search inside the pond as well, despite the fact that Jenny and Kevin didn't have the proper equipment with them at the time. He does a search of the property, but also comes up with nothing. Despite the fact that Debbie's whereabouts are currently unknown by anyone and she's seemingly just vanished, Watts says that a full-scale search can't be enacted until Debbie has been missing for at least three days. So exhausted and sick with worry, Jenny returns home for the night, hoping to hear from her daughter by the time morning rolls around. But the phone stays silent all night. December 27th arrives and Debbie's stepfather goes to the cabin to feed the dogs and notices something on the kitchen floor. It's a short-sleeved nurse's uniform, one of Debbie's, next to a crumpled pair of pantyhose. Whether or not this uniform was simply overlooked the day before, or if it wasn't present, isn't clear. Though I'd be hard-pressed to think that in searching for her missing daughter, she would leave any stone unturned. But it isn't until five days after Debbie's disappearance that a full-on search is conducted for the missing woman. And assuming that the pond has already been scoured, no divers are brought to the scene but neither the bloodhounds nor the police department were able to find Debbie or any clue as to where she might be. It seems she simply disappeared. Jenny, however, wasn't satisfied with the thoroughness of the search and thought that even if she and Kevin had had the means the day before to search the pond, the police should have investigated it again. And yet it remained almost a week later, the depths of the pond had not been scoured. So, Jenny takes matters into her own hands and hires Kevin and his friend Gordon Childress, both of whom have experience in recovery work, to dive and search the pond for any sign of Debbie. The search takes place on January 1st, 1986 in cold conditions and almost immediately after plunging into the water, something suspicious catches Gordon's eye. He sees two sets of footprints indented in the thick mud on the bottom of the pond, next to what appear to be drag marks. Gordon follows the drag marks 30 feet away from the bank where the depth of the water reaches over 5 feet, and that's when he sees Debbie, tragically, dead. Her body is inside of what Gordon described as a burn barrel, a rusty 55-gallon oil-type drum with holes in it, sitting on the bottom of the pond. Kevin and Gordon phone the police, who promptly arrive and confirm the deceased as Deborah Ann Wolfe. The investigation that follows takes a dark turn and pits the family against the police, and unfortunately, by the time it's over, there are still very few answers. So investigating what happened to Debbie Wolf began with Debbie herself and what her body was able to tell investigators from beyond the grave. The autopsy was performed by Dr. William Oliver a day after she was found on January 2nd, and what he found contradicts what he expected to find. He thought he would see water in her lungs, under the assumption that since she'd been found in the water, she had drowned. But there was only half of a teaspoon of water in her lungs. And in addition, there was no sign of white froth in her airways, and her body was in a relaxed position with her eyes and mouth closed, which is contrary to most drownings in which the person dies in panic with eyes opened and in a position of struggle. The coroner came to the conclusion that Debbie's death was not the result of drowning. There were also abrasions on Debbie's fingers, possibly an indicator she'd been fighting against something, maybe trying to fend off her killer. But there's no other sign of foul play visible on her skin other than that. Now, the police put forth the idea that she had fallen into the pond in some sort of accident on the night of the 25th. However, a week later, her body should have shown some sign of bloating or discoloration. There was none of that, though leaving the coroner to believe that she hadn't been in the water for long before she was found and that she'd been placed there post-mortem. A private investigator Jenny hired later also agreed with this conclusion that there was no way Debbie had been in the water since the 25th. This furthered by the fact that Jenny was able to have an open casket ceremony for her daughter's funeral. That's how well preserved she was. And finally, which should have been the most interesting part to police, was that despite their suggestion that her death was the result of a tragic accident, there was no trace of alcohol or drugs in Debbie's system. The final ruling for her cause of death by the coroner was undetermined, meaning he could not accurately conclude what had caused her death other than that she had not drowned. That fact alone creates serious problems for the police's theory that she had been playing with her two dogs and accidentally fell in and somehow became frightened and disoriented. Not only that, but the pond was shallow at the edges and her body was found where the water was five and a half feet deep, 30 feet from the shore. 
I know people who were taller than five and a half feet, and if I remember right, Debbie was only a few inches short of that. How could she have fallen in shallow waters, even in frigid temperatures, and become so confused that she ended up 30 feet further from where she fell in? And in addition, Jenny said that Debbie was an excellent swimmer, and that in the winter months, she never even ventured anywhere near the pond because she had no reason to. Things just don't add up to an accident. And yet, the police, for some reason, were insistent that no crime had been committed throughout the entirety of the rest of the investigation. They ignored the fact that Debbie normally kept her home and yard completely immaculate and would have never forgotten to feed her dogs. They ignored the fact that she was found in a barrel that was placed in the pond after she went missing, which is extremely suspicious and just screams foul play. But even stranger was the authorities' insistence that the so-called barrel that Gordon had found her body in didn't exist. They proposed that the barrel could have been Debbie's jacket, which might have ballooned out as she was lying at the angle on the bottom of the pond. And maybe you're thinking the same thing I was, which is how on earth could you deny the existence of a barrel that her body was found in? Gordon brought it ashore the day he pulled her body out of the pond. He knows what he saw, and a ballooned jacket looks very different from a rusted oil drum barrel. Kevin also saw the barrel, and so did Jenny. Jenny even thought it might have been the barrel that Debbie kept full of firewood at the side of the house, which was missing from its usual spot, as evidenced by the impression in the grass where it usually sat. A deputy named Don Smith also said he remembers seeing the barrel that day. So here's all these people saying that they've seen this barrel that Debbie's body was found in, including an officer. But the day after her body is found when the family and police return to the cabin to continue their investigation, the barrel is mysteriously gone. Thinking it may have somehow rolled back into the pond, they drain the pond to a two to three foot depth and they find nothing. No matter where the barrel went, there are two things that are certain. It should have been taken as evidence the day it was recovered, an error on police's part or on Gordon's part, I don't know. And any evidence that the barrel might have provided was now gone. With the pond drained, police asked Gordon to show them the footprints and the drag marks that he saw, but he is unable to locate them and police instantly claim that the footprints and drag marks had never existed. Which also makes no sense because without the footprints and the drag marks, Gordon wouldn't have been able to find Debbie's body within two minutes of starting to dive. If he were meandering around, scanning the pond without any clues, it likely would have taken him much longer. Still, police are sure the whole thing was an accident gone terribly wrong and continue to deny the existence of the barrel. Jenny, however, was growing very frustrated with the police's complete refusal to see any evidence that pointed to foul play. And that frustration grew when two months later in March of 1986, she was able to examine the clothing that Debbie was found in and finds that none of the clothes are Debbie's, she doesn't recognize any of it, and much of it doesn't even fit Debbie. So here's what Debbie Wolf was found wearing. Brown corduroy pants that were too large, the legs were too long, and they were unzipped. The cup size of the bra she was wearing was a size 38C, while Debbie wore a 34B. So it was three sizes too big and two sizes too big around. The shoes she was wearing were men's Nike shoes in a size six, while Debbie wore a woman's size seven, which translates to about three sizes too big. And curiously, when Jenny examined the shoes, there was no mud on them, which is strange because if at any point she'd been standing in the mud in the pond, there should have been some trace of it. But it was as if they'd been wiped clean. And when Jenny pointed this out, the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation said that they had had no mud on the shoes and that they had not been washed. Everything was exactly as it had been found on her body. The next item of interest was the jacket she had on. It was a brand new regulation army field jacket in a size men's small, and it had no name tag. No one who knew Debbie had any idea who it belonged to, but interestingly enough, Debbie did own an army field jacket. It was a hand-me-down from her brother, but it was a size large, and it was found still hanging in her closet. And just as a side note, North Carolina does have one of the largest U.S. Army installations at Fort Bragg. No one who knew Debbie had any idea who it belonged to, but interestingly enough, Debbie did own an Army field jacket. It was a hand-me-down from her brother, but it was a size large and was found still hanging in her closet. And just as a side note, North Carolina does have one of the largest U.S. Army installations at Fort Bragg. But moving on, she was wearing a black Pittsburgh Steelers shirt that neither Debbie's boyfriend or family recognized, and they had no clue where it could have come from. And perhaps most strange of all was Debbie was found wearing a handmade Indian necklace with glass beads and a small pouch. And inside this pouch was a symbol that Jenny researched and later found was an evil eye, which she said was a symbol that enabled the spirit to see its way into the next life. 
Jenny never knew her daughter to own any jewelry like this or even have any association with the ideology. Now, if what she saw was an evil eye, the only thing that I could find was that it was a curse, not a protection, though there is a hamsa, which is offered as a protection to the evil eye and is thought to bring prosperity and good luck to any who wear it. Which symbol she saw and described as an evil eye, or if it was even the same symbol that I'm associating it with, I have no idea. So the clothes Debbie was found wearing clearly didn't belong to her or her boyfriend or anyone that the family recognized. But that wasn't the end of the bizarre evidence. A family friend who went to feed Debbie's dogs found her wool stocking cap in the muddy bank on the opposite side of the pond that she was thought to have fallen in. Considering there was ice on the pond in the days following her disappearance, the friend thought it was highly improbable that the hat would have floated across the water to the opposite shore. And you may remember that I mentioned Debbie's stepfather found a short-sleeved nurse's uniform on the kitchen floor a day after her disappearance. However, it wasn't the uniform she'd been wearing on her last shift on the 25th. A coworker remembers that Debbie had been wearing a long-sleeved uniform, customary for the cold December weather, and that the same coworker remembers spilling coffee on Debbie's sleeve on the 25th. The uniform she was wearing on the last day that she was seen alive has never been located. Now, something that hasn't been clear while researching this is the status of Debbie's car, when it was and wasn't parked outside of her house. However, what is clear is that at some point, the car is parked outside of the house, and investigators notice that the driver's seat in the vehicle has been pushed all the way back, when it was usually pushed all the way forward because, as I mentioned earlier, Debbie only stood at about 5 foot 3 inches tall. Jenny says that her daughter didn't even mess with the seat adjustment because it was a pain to move and that it was parked in a manner that was unusual compared to its normal placement, so take that as you will. Some new evidence came to light recently when a former police officer in North Carolina named Dr. Maurice Godwin said that he discovered through the case files that there was semen found present inside of Debbie. However, back in 1986, DNA profiling wasn't as prevalent as it is today, and the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department says that the vaginal swab has been lost since. So we have a possible hit, leading to a dead end. And finding the vaginal swab 30 years later seems next to impossible, but uncovering it might lead to a breakthrough in the case. Until then, we have to go with what we know. And all of this leads us back to the most chilling piece of evidence that could have led to her killer. The voicemail. Who left it? And why did they say that Debbie had missed several days of work when she hadn't missed a single hour until the day she disappeared? Was it an eerie coincidence, or was it her killer or kidnapper trying to throw off investigators? Police found that the voice on the answering machine belonged to a man who volunteered at the Veterans Hospital, a man who'd taken a special interest in Debbie, who was in charge of coordinating the volunteers. He'd confessed his desire to be more than friends, but Debbie said that Friends was all they could ever be, and that she was already seeing someone else, her boyfriend. Friends and family confirmed that Debbie had told them about the volunteer's romantic confession and about her subsequent rejection. Police claimed to have investigated this volunteer and cleared him of involvement. But Debbie, it seems, was well-liked, and she had caught the eye of a second male volunteer who had been a bit more forward and persistent with his advances. The second man made Debbie uncomfortable, as he had had a long history of psychiatric illnesses and couldn't seem to take no for an answer, despite the fact that she told him she had a boyfriend multiple times and wasn't interested in him. This man was also interviewed by police, however, he had an alibi, but he refused to take a polygraph test, and with no evidence to hold him, the police released him. But he skipped town and traveled out of the state a few days later. Neither of the names of these two suspects have been released, so their whereabouts are currently as unknown as their identities. So even with all of the evidence and clues put before us, we still come up short of a solid conclusion, which leaves us with our own speculations and theories as to what happened to Debbie Wolf. For me personally, I would rule out the police's theory immediately. There's so much about Debbie's death being an accident that doesn't add up with the given evidence. And most importantly, the coroner says that there was no way she had been in the water since the day she'd gone missing. And unfortunately, it seems that there was a lot of police error in this investigation, therefore I think an accidental drowning was not what happened to Debbie. A theory that some say was that she was ambushed at her home and subsequently sexually assaulted and killed, but if this was the case, her body wouldn't have been dumped until after Jenny discovered her daughter missing. And Jenny found no sign of Debbie on the 26th, meaning the killer might have taken her body elsewhere that day, maybe in a panic or to redress her or what have you. However, the theory that seems most likely to me is the one that Jenny proposed, that her daughter was being stalked by one of these hospital volunteers, or it's possible by both of them, and either one of them obtained her address and phone number and ambushed her at her home, 
took her hostage somewhere where she was raped, killed, redressed, and then transported back to her cabin and dumped into the pond. A private detective named Robert Frasco was hired by TV Guide magazine to research the case, and he also agreed with this conclusion. He cited the fact that Debbie's body was free of silt, which the pond was full of, meaning she'd been placed in the water, not fallen in and that the barrel could have contained incriminating fingerprints or other evidence, hence why it was removed. He also theorized that she'd been abducted in her own car, which would explain why the seat was pushed all the way back, especially if her attacker was larger than her. Frasco believes her killer was the man who left the voicemail. Something I personally found interesting while researching was the fact that Gordon Childress, the man who found Debbie's body, said that there were footprints and drag marks in the mud, which later couldn't be found. The police also mentioned that the bottom of the pond was covered in moss and it would have been impossible to see any footprints in the mud because of this. Now there's no pictures of the bottom of the pond so it's difficult for me to judge based on that. And I'm not accusing anyone of anything. I obviously wasn't there and I obviously don't know how close of a family friend Gordon was. But for a moment, let's say the police were right on this mark and that there was no footprints and couldn't have been any. Gordon found the body within a matter of minutes. He dragged the barrel out of the water knew where it was, and the next day the barrel is gone. Now again, I'm not throwing accusations, but when I started thinking about this, it made me wonder whether or not the crime was committed, or at least partially committed, by someone helping with the investigation. And I say this not only due to the numerous police errors, but because of this. Whoever killed Debbie had to have, at some point, returned to the pond after Jenny and Kevin searched the grounds to put her body in the water. Whether or not she was alive during the day she was missing or not, we don't know but someone had to have returned to hide the body. Not only were they able to return and hide the body, but it's a possibility the perpetrator was also the one who returned to take the barrel away. If it wasn't someone involved in the investigation and it wasn't the police, it had to have been someone who knew that the body had been found and someone who knew about the barrel. Someone who knew when it would be safe to return without the fear of being discovered for removing evidence. But I could be completely off too because unfortunately, coincidences exist and maybe the killer just got lucky. But I think it's good to explore all possibilities when we're trying to find justice for another human being. But whether or not this case could have been saved were it not for shoddy police work and the refusal to believe that foul play was involved, we have no idea. It certainly couldn't have hurt to have the police on Jenny's side when she was grieving and still desperately searching for answers. Unfortunately, after having to bury her own daughter, she searched for answers until her dying day in 2002, and never found any closure, though she believed someone knew what happened to her daughter and only wanted answers. Answers that to this day we still don't have, as the case for Deborah Ann Wolf still goes unsolved. So no matter what you choose to believe, what you speculate, I ask you only for respect in the comments, and if you have any new information on the case, the police number for the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office can be found in the description below. Sources and additional reading can also be found below as well. And remember, while these may be dark matters, the darkness always matters. If you would like to see more videos from me, don't forget to subscribe, or if you're looking for more discussion on strange or unsolved cases, you can check out some of my other videos by clicking on the screen now. I will see you in the next video. Stay safe, friends, and have a good night.